Dr. Trotty, you know, many of you have met earlier today. I will introduce her again. She is the Associate Professor of Neurology at Emory University in Atlanta. She graduated from Baylor College of Medicine and completed her neurology residency, sleep fellowship, and Masters of Science in Clinical Research at Emory. Her main area of clinical research interest is the central disorders of hypersomnolence. Dr. Trotty is currently funded by the National Institute of Health and the American Academy of Sleep Medicine Foundation as the principal investigator of two clinical trials investigating treatments for hypersomnolence. She is the recipient of the Hypersomnia Foundation's 2020 Impact Award, and in bestowing this award, the Foundation noted her outstanding and ongoing contributions to IH research, her exceptional care of her patients, and her multiple advocacy and ed education efforts as chair of the Foundation's Medical Advisory Board from its inception in 2014 to 2020. And also she is joined today by Amy, who is a longtime supporter of the Hypersomnia Foundation, serving currently as our CFO. She is living with hypersomnia and is the mother to a two-year-old daughter named Ava. Thank you, Dr. Trotty, again, and here's Amy. All right, hello again. I have the same disclosure as I had a couple hours ago. Right, so I am gonna talk about, we are gonna talk about issues around pregnancy and parenting for people with IH and, and related disorders. Um, and I just kinda wanna start out with an acknowledgement that this is tough. There is nothing easy about living with IH, but issues around parenting can be particularly uh, difficult and, and related to self sense of self. So I, I just wanted to kind of leave some space for that as, as we get started and I get caught up in the, in the details. So <laughs> I don't know why I'm like advertising the Hypersomnia Foundation at the Hypersomnia Foundation meeting, but um, there is an incredibly, incredibly valuable resource um, about issues related to parenthood and pregnancy and medications. I send my colleagues to it all the time. Um, when they say, what do I do? This person has IH and they want to get pregnant um, because it is an incredibly rich resource, but it is for patients and providers. So um, much, many of my slides came from ideas in, in that uh, website. So, you know, I think the first question really that people have to tackle and, and certainly people want to talk through um, sometimes is, you know, does, is it even possible to have a kid and have IH uh, at the same time? Um, and I, you know, the answer to that question is different for every person. I don't think there is a, a single answer to it, but I think some things to think about when trying to make that decision are, you know, what's gonna happen during the pregnancy and then what's gonna happen after there's a kid on the scene? Because those are a whole different set of issues. There's some things you already know that you can take into the decision, right? How bad is your IH to start? How well do medications work to start? How good is your support network? Some people have really well controlled IH and they manage really, really well and they have a lot of support and so it's gonna be a lot easier to contemplate than someone who has failed a lot of medicines and really can't get control of symptoms. The big unknowns though, I think are part of what makes this question so hard, which is we don't know what's gonna to happen to IH symptoms during pregnancy. There's no real data about what happens to IH with pregnancy. I have seen it go lots of different ways. Um, sometimes it gets better. <laughs> um, sometimes it's just not quite as bad as people think it will be. Um, but it, it really is an unknown. Um, and then of course, postpartum, what will that do to the IH? And we don't know the answer to that question either. Um, and then also, of course, I, I will be talking a lot in this talk about pregnancy, because that is a particular time that's, uh, that's challenging, but I would be remiss if I didn't say, of course, giving birth is not the only way to become a parent, so um, you can certainly skip the pregnancy part and go to the parenthood part. Um, and maybe for some people that is the right solution to this problem. So assuming someone wants to get pregnant, the really tough question that comes up a lot is, what do I do about medications during pregnancy? So I have colleagues who I respect very much who take a absolute hardline approach, which is 
No one with IH should take any IH medications during pregnancy, hard stop. That is not where I land um, because I think life would be easy if we just had to balance like risk against zero risk, but that's never the situation, right? We have to balance what are the risks of taking medication during pregnancy with the risks of not taking medication during pregnancy, with the harms of not taking medications during pregnancy. IH is a tough disease. People need medications for it. Um, and so as people are trying to decide, you know, should I take a medicine, should I stop all of my medicines, it's important not to think just about what the harms of, are of the medicines, but what will happen if you don't take medicines? Can you still drive? Being in an accident is also not good for developing fetuses. Um, can you still work? Can you still have a meaningful quality of life um, at the level that you need to? Um, and so I think the conversation should always be about balancing um, those harms. Plenty of people decide to go through pregnancy without medication. Some people decide to stay on some medication during pregnancy. This is a whole talk of there is no one right answer. <laughs> um, if people are thinking about using medication during pregnancy, I would say these are kind of the things to keep in mind about, about how to plan for that. So first is plan for that. So it is much better to make a plan before becoming pregnant than after you are already pregnant um, for a number of reasons, but a big one being that most of us don't know we're pregnant until we've been pregnant a while, and a lot of really important things happen in that very early phase. And so if you're going to stop medicines, if your goal is to stop medicines, you want to stop them before. If your goal is to change to a safer medicine, you want to do that before. Half of pregnancies in this country are unplanned, so that doesn't always happen, but that is the goal. For conditions that require medications during pregnancy, like say epilepsy, the standard rule of thumb is it's generally better to have one exposure during pregnancy than multiple exposures during pregnancy, by which I mean if you know ahead of time and you can get people on the safest medicine before they get pregnant and they stay on that one medicine all throughout pregnancy because they already got on it and they already knew they tolerated it and it worked, that's great. If somebody has to start a medicine during pregnancy and it doesn't work or they can't tolerate it, then they have to start a different medication during pregnancy, and then they've had two different medication exposures as opposed to just one. So another reason to plan ahead. Another principle to consider when thinking about medication use during pregnancy is not all parts of the pregnancy are the same level of risk. So the first trimester is where much of the organ development happens, and so some women will not take medicine during the first trimester, but cautiously introduce medication later on in pregnancy. For some medications, particularly ones where there, there could be a withdrawal um, syndrome late in the third trimester is another high risk time because if the, if the medication is getting past the placenta and then the baby is born and then suddenly doesn't have the medication, that can, that can sometimes cause some, some neonatal issues. But no part of pregnancy is totally risk-free, the brain pretty important organ, and the brain develops all throughout pregnancy. And so there are higher risk periods than others, but none that are totally free of risk. Another principle for medication use during pregnancy is just the lowest dose as infrequently as possible. So for people who are pregnant who have to take medication, maybe they don't have to take the full dose that they used for optimal functioning before they were pregnant, but a lesser dose to sort of get by. Um, and then something I learned from the Hypersomnia Foundation website, I am not ashamed to say, although I learned it before it was posted on the, on the website, that, that some OB consultants um, gave, gave this advice to um, the Hypersomnia Foundation is for some people who are trying to get pregnant, they know they want to be off medications and they stop medications and then they very quickly get pregnant and then they get through their pregnancy and they start medications again. And that is great. For lots of people, they don't get pregnant right away. And so there are lots of people who are trying to get pregnant for a really long time. And so if they want to come off medicines, it's not just nine months of being off medicines. It's nine months plus all the months it might take before that. And that makes it even harder, obviously. And so while some people choose to come off medicines for that whole period, there is another option, which is to strategically take medications during the time you're trying to conceive, only during the windows where you know you're not pregnant, right? Because during the time you're trying to conceive, you're not pregnant. You're not at risk of pregnancy the whole time. And so there is this idea of a safety zone where 
if you're not pregnant that month, you can take your medicines a while until you try again to get pregnant the next month. And I will show you what that looks like because otherwise I'm just up here waving my hands around it. So I will say the asterisks here, this, this makes some assumptions. There are no perfect solutions in medicine. This assumes that you have a regular 28-day cycle. Lots of people don't. Uh, it can be adjusted if you have a regular cycle or it can be adjusted to sort of the worst case scenario if you have an irregular cycle. It also assumes that everybody eliminates drugs at exactly the same rate, um, but in the absence of liver or kidney uh, abnormalities, for most of us, there's a fairly predictable uh, elimination. So the idea is, um, if day one is the first day of your period, day 14 is ovulation. So you might think, well, as long as, as, long as I've stopped the drug by ovulation, I should be OK. It's actually uh, different than that because it takes some time for the egg that gets you know, released to actually get an implant in the uterus. So until the fertilized egg implants in the uterus, it doesn't have attachment to the blood supply. So it doesn't get exposed to what you have in your bloodstream. And so it's actually after it travels through the fallopian tube and down and implants in the uterus is when you need to be free of medication in your bloodstream. So actually, implantation for most people is day 22. There's a range around that. So I have 20 here as sort of a, a window of, of caution. So probably the earliest day of implantation is day 20, which means you just need to be free of medication by day 19. And so then you can work backwards to see how many days it takes to get the medicine out of your system. And you might actually be able to take the medication for like two weeks on, two weeks off, for all the months it takes to conceive, as opposed to being totally med-free that whole time. And I think that is more uh, feasible for some people to, continue, to consider. And so here's just an example with amphetamine salts um, that, um, to, to make it a little bit more concrete, so the half-life is 15 hours, and so to get it out of your system takes about three days. You wanna be med-free by day 19, so you can take it from day one through day 16 and then you just have the rest of the cycle without, uh, without medication. What do we know about the medications we use for IH in pregnancy? Not nearly enough. There is so much more that we don't know than that we do know about these medications. Um, the, um, we know some stuff, and so it's a, a really important conversation about which medicine you're on and if there are different alternatives. I'm not gonna list all of the medications because I wanted to make sure we had time for questions at the end, but I have a slide if we wanna talk about specific medications at the end. I'm just highlighting two here. Um, one, um, I'm highlighting modafinil and armodafinil because when I started doing this, longer ago now than it used to be, but still not that long ago, um, we thought modafinil was safe in pregnancy. Like I actually put some people on modafinil instead of what they were on because we thought it was the safer alternative based on animal data. And that is not true. So in the last few years, a few different studies have come out that suggest not perfectly consistent, but a similar signal suggesting increased risk of um, congenital mal malformations, about probably three times higher the normal baseline risk. The normal baseline risk is 3%. None of us, regardless of whether we do everything right or not, have any control over that baseline risk. Um, but we no longer recommend that people use modafinil or armodafinil if they are trying to get pregnant or during pregnancy. Um, and then just because uh, lower sodium oxabate is uh, FDA approved for IH, I put the oxabates on here. We don't really have enough human data to know what the risk is. There are some animal data that suggest harm. Not all treatment of IH is medications, right? Um, we have to think about things like leave and accommodations because just like those can be helpful outside of pregnancy, those can become even more important during pregnancy. So um, if sometimes people's need for accommodations change a lot when they are pregnant, especially if they come off medications, but also just potentially because of pregnancy. And so I think things to think about in terms of planning for work or school during pregnancy are again driving safety, especially off of medications, 
for lots of people getting to work on time, um, maybe reduced hours, maybe shifted hours later in the day for people who can't wake up as early in the morning but might do better working a little bit later, more breaks. I have had a few women go on short-term disability throughout their pregnancy. Most short-term disability carriers won't pay for this, but occasionally they will. And so I've had a few women um, manage to go off medications, not be able to work because they were off medications, but then have disability coverage during that time. Um, I, this is my adorable son. He's not that adorable. He's actually still that adorable, just a lot older now. Um, but um, I, put, I put his soccer, soccer picture on here just to say that I think this really should be a team approach. So, you know, I already think it's pretty important that my patient and I are a team making these decisions, but I think for issues related to pregnancy, it really helps to have another team member who is a what's casually referred to as a high-risk OB or officially as a maternal fetal medicine specialist. The idea is it's an OB who provides care to women at higher risk because of medical problems or medications or what have you. Um, is that like, are you playing me off? Is that what that means? Okay. Um, the, <laughs> the, um, the, the reason I say that is like as sleep doctors, we don't, we see lots of IH, lots of narcolepsy and not that much pregnancy. High risk obesity, women on medicines for every indication under the sun during pregnancy. And so they have, tend to have a different lens through which to view those risk benefit um, decisions. You can call and get a preconception consultation with these people and say, here, here are my medications. I don't know what to do during pregnancy. I'm thinking of getting pregnant. Um, and those can be helpful. Um, after the baby comes out, they have to be fed. Um, I don't know why my fed is best font got so small. The fed is best font was supposed to be the largest font on this screen. Having a baby eat food is good for the baby. Um, there's lots out there about breastfeeding and formula feeding and what have you, but remember that like formula is the right option for many, many, many people for many, many, many reasons depending on how old this audience is. Many of us were raised on formula. We seem all right. Um, so uh, I don't say that to downplay the importance of breastfeeding. Breastfeeding is you know, uh, the right choice for some people as well. Um, but just I wish we gave people a little less guilt about this decision as a society. Um, the studies of medications and breastfeeding are all like four women <laughs> took modafinil, and this is what we found. Five women took this drug, and this is what we found. They are all tiny. We don't publish these tiny studies as tiny on anything else. Um, and so we really know very little. Um, again, it's a matter of risk trade-offs. Um, Oxabates are the one IH medication that are cleared pretty quickly, in fact, fast enough that after you take a dose of sodium oxabate, it is out of breast milk five hours later. So it is theoretically possible to do a combination of breastfeeding and take oxabate overnight. The issue is because you're asleep so deeply with the oxabate, someone else has to be there to help with care and feeding overnight because um, you may not be able to do that. All right, I don't want Amy to run out of time, so I'm gonna stop talking for now and have Amy come on up here. Do you have your own? Do you have your own? All right. Hi, my name is Amy Damaris. Some quick background info. I have had a diagnosis of idiopathic hypersomnia for about eight years and I've been involved with the Hypersomnia Foundation for about the same time in various roles, including volunteer, board member, and now CFO. My main symptoms before diagnosis and treatment were horrible sleep inertia, so not being able to transition from sleep to awake in the mornings, automatic behaviors, including yelling at my husband, and sleeping through multiple alarms. Excessive daytime sleepiness, meaning I'd sleep eight to 10 hours at night and still be sleepy during the day, and brain fog or difficulty focusing and poor executive functioning. I tried many medications, including different doses of modafinil, Ritalin, Concerta, Clarithromycin, and Flumazenil. Won't go into detail about what all of those are since we just had the alternative medications panel right before this, but I landed on a combination of Concerta and Ritalin and also flumazenil, which was my treatment for about five years. 
The flumazenol essentially cured my sleep inertia and the stimulants kept me going during the day and ensured I didn't fall asleep on my hour plus commute to work every day. I had some symptoms under control with medication, uh, but being on the stimulants long term, it also had some concerning cardiovascular side effects, so it wasn't perfect. Just making the decision to try for a baby on purpose was a really hard decision. My local doctor recommended stopping all medications once I had a positive pregnancy test and cautioned that the first trimester can be the most difficult. And on top of the pregnancy, looking forward even further, I had all these concerns of, you know, what if I'm just too sick to be a parent? What if I'm too sleepy to take care of a baby? And what if I can't even wake up when the baby cries and when they need me at night? It was important for me to have support in place and plan for the worst before even starting to try. My husband, Evan, and I planned for me to be out of commission for months during pregnancy and possibly several months after the baby was born as our worst case scenario. Some things that were out of my control, but that really allowed for me to be comfortable with the decision to try to have a baby were the social expectations being to stay home due to COVID-19 and also being laid off and having decent severance. So I felt financially secure, at least in the short term. Once I became pregnant, before I even had a positive pregnancy test, I started to notice that my symptoms were changing. I am one of the lucky ones who experienced some symptom relief during my pregnancy. I started waking up before my alarm. I felt decently awake, which is something I hadn't felt in a long time, if ever. And once I knew I was pregnant, uh, confirmed with a positive test in 2020, I decided to experiment and let myself nap and not set an alarm and just see what happened. And to my shock and surprise, I woke up about 25 minutes later feeling pretty refreshed. I had never experienced this before. My naps were typically long and unrefreshing, which is why they were not part of my regular schedule. Now, it's already difficult for me to relate to people because of living with a chronic illness, especially with small talk. And people would come up to me and say things like, oh, you must be so tired. I was exhausted during my pregnancy. And I would agree out of politeness to most people. But in reality, I was like, this is the most awake I have ever felt in my life. Imagine that, a time that most women describe as the most exhausted they have ever felt is the most awake I have ever felt. I did feel very tired while I was pregnant, but it was nothing compared to the excessive daytime sleepiness, brain fog, and sleep inertia that are idiopathic hypersomnia. The relief I felt from my symptoms during pregnancy gives me hope that we can find a way to replicate it with medication because the other option is to be pregnant all the time, and I don't think I can do that. After my baby Ava arrived, it was difficult to tell when my symptoms started to come back because I was experiencing the actual sleep deprivation of having a newborn. It turned out that my mother's ear is quite strong. As I mentioned, one of the things I was afraid of was not being able to take care for my baby at night and not waking up when she cried. And my sleep inertia is somehow the one symptom that has completely disappeared and is still gone today, three years later. Not only do I wake up when she cries, but I even wake up when she's just rolling over and tossing and turning on the monitor. And I hope that pregnancy has changed my brain forever in this way. I also chose to breastfeed and to continue to breastfeed in the second year as recommended by the Academy, American Academy of Pediatrics. This meant that I would remain untreated until, I was, until she was fully weaned. It wasn't ideal since my excessive daytime sleepiness and brain fog fully returned at about one year postpartum. And I feel like I could be a better mother and wife if there were a treatment that could give me more wakeful hours each day. But my husband and I made it work the available treatment options just weren't effective enough for me to want to forgo the benefits of breastfeeding. But at 20 months old, I now had a toddler, and I was ready to start trying some of the new medications that had been approved recently in order to be able to be a better mother to my very energetic toddler and improve my quality of life. And this was my motivation to stop breastfeeding. The medication process is still ongoing. As a family, we decided I would stay home with the baby and I started working part-time from home as the CFO of the Hypersomnia Foundation in January 2022. 
I would not be able to go back to work full time without an effective treatment, even from home or with accommodation. So I'm really hoping to find that. Overall, Ava's doing great. She's in daycare two full days a week, which is really wonderful. And we probably would have started sooner if it weren't for COVID. It is so important to me to have consistent breaks, to be able to rest and occasionally just do something that I want to do for fun. Because being a mom really is a 24 hour job on top of managing chronic illness. The one thing um, I've also found super important and helpful is social support. I would like to plug the Hey Prayers Pregnancy and Parenting with Narcolepsy group that Wake Up Narcolepsy provides. I didn't find it until my baby was already 16 months old, but there are people who go to the group for years before even starting to try for a baby in order to understand the challenges and options from other people's lived experience. And another thing I wanted to mention, which I had never really heard of before going to the group, was maternal fetal medicine that Dr. Trotty was talking about. Um, my understanding is that they're particularly good to consult with if you want to continue to take any medication during pregnancy, and they'll work with you to minimize risk while still getting some quality of life for you. And I think I would probably do this if I were to have another baby. Although my symptoms improved, I think being pregnant with age while looking after a child might need some additional assistance. Um, okay, that's all for me. Thank you for listening to my experience, and hopefully we still have time for some questions. I'm told we have questions. Okay. All right, so uh, were there any questions in the room before I move to online? Okay, I see one hand raised. Hey, thank you. Lisa. Um, so is there a resource or somewhere where we can find maternal fetal medicine specialists to be able to refer moms to before or during pregnancy? Um, that's a great, I'm sure there's a, like, I'm sure there's a MFM, Society for MFM or whatever network that probably has a provider list. I usually just tell people to go with their insurance list because, you know, they're not, it depends where you live. I live in Atlanta, so I'm a little spoiled. <laughs> like, we definitely have MFM specialists there, but, um, yeah, I think that'd be where I'd just have people start. I know that there is, a, there's a web page that has MFMs that you can, yeah. um, and it will be on the new website because I remember making that recommendation. Oh, sweet. <laughs> you can go to the Hypersomnia Foundation's <laughs> website. All right. Uh, this might be one for you, Amy. Um, what are some tips uh, for handling pregnancy and a toddler while having IH and no medication? Yeah, that's, that's hard. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I think it's really just trying to, you know, get your village together and find as much support as you can because there's not there's not a lot you can do and, and it doesn't last forever, right? So, the, you know, the toddler years, you'll, you'll get through them and try to enjoy them as much as you can. <laughs> Any other questions in the room before an online question? One in the back. Just hang on. Hi, Jalissa. It's a very odd question, and I'm sure it's like uncharted territory, but like it sounds like your pregnancy helped alleviate your symptoms during and after the pregnancy. Have there been cases where women with IH who become pregnant actually take the other direction? Where the IH gets worse during pregnancy? And I'm even sure after pregnancy. Oh. Um, so, the, so the question is, are there women whose IH after pregnancy is worse than it was before pregnancy? I'm sure there are. Um, I, um, what I have personally seen among my patients is, I would say not necessarily that the IH is worse overall, but the medicines don't seem to work the way they did before. So somebody who had been on a medicine for a long time and done well, came off it for pregnancy, and then when they tried to restart it, we realized we needed to try something different because it just wasn't, it just wasn't working the same way. Um, that's that's more what I've seen. All right, and another online question: uh, How can I start the conversation with my OB 
uh, Joanne about me wanting to become pregnant so that they know how to best support and monitor me? That's a great question. Do you mm. want to say anything about how you started that conversation? Um, I mean, I just said I'd like an MFM consult to my OB. <laughs> that's what I said. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's what I was going to yeah. say. Is you just like OBs are used to people wanting to plan for their pregnancies and, and being on medicine. So I, I think if you just say, like, I am planning to get pregnant, I have this rare disease, I am on these medications, I need some help, I, I think OBs are going to be very open to that as a general rule. That was, uh, that was our experience as well when we when we wanted to consider having kids, we just said, hey, she's on a lot of medications. We're not, we're concerned about not just the IH medications, but asthma medications, other different medications for other chronic um, issues. And uh, they, they were very accessible and very, um, it was easy to get something scheduled and talk to someone who had some really good advice that actually matched up quite well with your advice of sometimes it is better for you to be medicated because the harm of you not being medicated also exists. Other questions in the room? All right, maybe one more from online. Uh, how do I go about creating a treatment plan? Should this begin as soon as be as we begin trying years in advance or as soon as I know I'm pregnant? So I definitely think if you have pregnancy like plans on your horizon, it's time to start talking about it. It is much better to make a plan ahead of time, implement that plan and see, you know, get stable on it um, before you're pregnant. Once you're pregnant, First of all, you've probably, you've potentially been doing something that wasn't your plan for the early part of your pregnancy, and then once you're already pregnant, any changes you make are, um, are additional changes. That happens sometimes, and that's fine. Like, we just work it out. But in an ideal world, I would say, like, a year before you're... Uh, planning to get pregnant is when you start talking about it. I talk about it with people and probably until they're sick of me asking. Um, like 18-year-olds really don't want to talk about their pregnancy <laughs> plans, but um, I, don't, I don't think it's too soon to start thinking about it. Okay, one more question in the room. Yeah, sorry. Here we go. Uh, one, like, have you ever had a patient, like, ordered a Dutch test for a patient, if you know what that is? Um, it's like a hormone test, like, using dried urine. It's very, I don't know, maybe voodoo medicine, voodoo test. But um, just curious if you have any information about that. And then two, like, what do you typically recommend for... Um, women that want to like track their cycles. I know that there's like natural cycles out there that uses, you know, like either the aura ring or a thermometer that you kind of do like test every morning or whatever. Um, so yeah, what are your thoughts about those two things? I am not familiar with the first, I confess, so I can't tell you anything about that. Um, the um, the second is a question I would tell people to, <laughs> to talk to their OB about because I know my limits. Um, when I went to medical school, it was definitely temperature, but I'm old. So, <laughs> um, you know, we didn't have aura rings back then. So, um, so I actually don't know if, I don't know what the most effective is now. But yeah, your OB probably does, or GYN does. Due to adenomyosis, endometriosis, polyps, fibroids, cysts, and all that, um, I had all kinds of fun stuff with having periods that just would never end the last few years. So I ended up getting, after, I, after 19 years of birth control, trying to control symptoms that doesn't work, and they are terrible. And if you don't say the magic word of I'm trying to get pregnant, you don't unlock this special like next level access of having a laparoscopy. So I ended up getting a DAISY, which is a basal thermometer. It has an app, it syncs over Bluetooth, and it gets very confused when you bleed for four months straight, but 
you can keep track of things. And if you're trying to conceive, it does, on, on the months that I manage to ovulate and have a cycle where I'm not bleeding for months on end, um, I can actually tell the date that I did ovulate, which is fun because then when I start to have pain on the left side and it gets a little weird, then I know that I'm going to have a cyst rupture that will hurt like a kidney stone. So it's just like a little extra clue. But Daisy, it's D-A-Y-S-Y. Super cool. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate the Thank time. Thank you.